many devotees have different senior devotees have different theories on um, what some of the problems um, with Gaudiya Vaishnavism in the West today is. And I know I've heard you speak um, quite a bit on Guru, the understanding of Guru Tattva being quite a, quite a problem. And I was wondering what you think some fundamental points of Guru Tattva that it cleared up um, amongst, I guess, the wider, broader um, range of devotees in the West might help um, bring a bit more, mm. I guess, yeah, uh, dignity or what have you from Guru Vaishnavism. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, just very um, a simple and practical point that um, without strong spiritual leadership, then um, the, uh, the congregation will be lacking in uh, understanding and, um, and, and spiritual enthusiasm. Um, and there has been uh, in the community, international community of Bodhi Vaishnavism, quite a problem with spiritual leadership. So um, it would seem from that that Yes, there is a misunderstanding of Guru Tattva as far as who is a guru, and what, are the, what are the qualifications, what, what that involves, and so forth. Um, and when that's not well understood, I mean, just speaking in a very general way, then you, you get these earth-shattering kind of problems where the leadership turns out to be less than qualified, and um, it's. Uh, you know, faith is said to be uh, difficult to uh, to secure, but easy to easy to crack, if you will. And uh, that uh, when there's to use the poetic uh, phrase of Pujapatrita Marsh, when there's suspicion and there's suspension, I often speak about uh, this idea that faith is the animating principle in, in life that we, by which we may go forward in whatever endeavor. And certainly this is the case with bhakti. And uh, so if the faith is um, damaged either individually to oneself or to within the, the community and so forth to others, um, that's a big problem. So that has been a, a, a problem. I mean, what then is lacking in terms of the understanding of, of Guru Tattva? Um, there are a number of... Uh, it's a complex tattva. And, um, but I would say that I am, in a broader sense, um, a lack of scriptural understanding of the tattva is probably at the heart of then the, the problems that we see in failed um, leadership. Um, and so perhaps it's uh, not well understood and then taken up by persons not qualified because they don't understand it. And uh, so it's a recipe for, 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 um, for problems. <clears throat> about Guru Tattva other than the general way 
that I'm speaking about at, at the moment. Um, there have been, for example, um, let's say, after the, the, the international community of Kodi Vaishnavism was really spawned by our party bar, and um, um, through the vision of Bhakti Vinod that was given some shape um, by Bhakti Siddhanta and then actually carried out, taken country to country, so to speak, by um, my Guru Maharaj. So our particular community, our particular Paribar within the Gaudiya community has been responsible largely for that wide kind of distribution circulation. It's kind of a characteristic of our um, party bar. And, um, and because of that, we have a slightly different approach to esoteric inner um, life uh, with emphasis, for example, on kirtan um, and a dynamic sense of kirtan that uh, involves, for example, trying to explain a very complex theological and philosophical ideology from a different uh, continent, culture, uh, whose main book is written in Sanskrit thousands of years ago, um, to people who have no acquaintance with it, that takes um, it's a challenge that if one rises to the occasion, it has great capacity to, to, to harness the mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, harnessing the mind um, is, uh, opens the, the doorway, if you will, for, for inner life. You have external bhakti, you have internal bhakti. And, um, the harnessing of the mind and, and, and the senses uh, is required through the in the context of the practices, through such practices, to um, if one is to uh, significantly uh, experience uh, inner life and and um, cultivate it in an on ongoing way, um, and so. As I say, this is quite a challenge uh, to um, uh, a challenge that I should say that maybe at the same time it may be a considerable difficult um, controlling the mind in general is difficult, and it may be an approach that that is. At the, Difficult at the same time, more readily, um, and more suitable for um, the larger international community in a modern <coughs> world uh, compared to living in, along the bank of the Ganges in an ashram in. Uh, not deep and conducting oneself with a small community in ways that are likely very, very similar to um, what was taking place centuries ago without much change. The community that, has, that, that doesn't know about, care about, the rest of the world, so to speak, um, that, that wouldn't be known about if it weren't perhaps for our our party bar and so forth. Um, um, so those types of communities are there, the, the vitality of them and so forth um, that uh, would have to be Examined on an individual basis, and I'm sure that there 
there's plenty of Anishta Bhajana Kriya going on there, and there are probably problems as well, but um, it would be more challenging for a person from California, let's say, to, you know, to try to do that in California, hmm? or to go there and, 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 and live there. And so, nonetheless, they need a challenge to harness the mind, and this was somewhat the, the vision of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsati Thakur to say, try to give shape to Bhakti Vinod's idea. It was, it was an idea of Bhakti Vinod to interface with the modern world, but it was an idea that it's not that he thought, maybe I should interface with the modern world. He was interfaced with the modern world. And for sometimes I refer to him as the first Western convert because his body was in India, but his mind was in the West, largely getting a Western education, working for the British, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was speaking about this the other night. It's interesting because at the time of the um, formation of the Sampradaya, the founding Acharyas, the Goswamis, this was a period that um, coincided uh, largely with a revolution in Europe, hmm? the Copernican revolution which was, that, uh, as you know, the, the, the idea that the planets revolve around the sun rather than around the earth, and the beginning of the, of the, of the European um, scientific revolution. Observation from a certain perspective, um, it brought question to the dominant in the West world view, which, I mean, I'm talking about Europe, which was a biblical world view. Mm -hmm. So some of the observations seem to contradict the, the revelation, the biblical revelation. And so, so they had to theologize and think how to, how to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, Revelation, so that it wouldn't be in contradiction to what's right in front of your face, something like that. So, then, so meanwhile in India, quite a distance from that, um, there were there is evidence that there were some traditionalists, not Gaudis, but traditionalists means um, the persons whose whose worldview was entirely informed. Um, by the sacred uh, texts. Hmm? Um, some such people, traditionalists we'll call them, whether they be yogins or monists, uh, Hinduism is, is, is a broad um, uh, umbrella hmm? of different uh, disciplines and so forth. Um, but some of them uh, were aware of that and tried to respond to it and in some ways they did but our Gaudi Acharyas they didn't they didn't bother with it or they didn't know about it as I was saying the other night uh, um, they were pretty busy just establishing credibility for their worldview within India in relation to other traditionalists other Sampradayas and so forth mm -hmm. but uh, by the time of Bhakti Vinod I mean you know, obviously, it, it couldn't be ignored. Um, he was kind of coming from there, in a sense, with it, hmm? and meeting then Chaitanya Charitamrita, being inspired, seeing the Bhagavad with the light of, of the person of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm? The example of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained to him what is, what is the Bhagavatam really saying, hmm? that it wasn't hedonistic, that it wasn't um, um, licentious, um, that it wasn't uh, um, uh, mythological in a in a pejorative sense, or um, that, that, it, uh, that it was it was uh, a story 
that had the power, as I've written elsewhere, to conquer the kingdom of the mind, the story of Radha and Krishna. It had the power. And, and harnessing the mind, of course, um, in the yogic sense, in a, in a comprehensive sense, and mastery over the human passions might open a door, as it, as it does, to, a, to an inner life that's, that the scientific, scientific revolution didn't get to. You know, from the idea that the planets revolve around the sun rather than the earth to the idea that the world is orbiting around the Atma, around consciousness. Um, you might get maybe a glimpse of that relative to your interpretation of quantum mechanics, but you see it firsthand, subjectively, through these inner disciplines for, for inner life, right? So, so at any rate, um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Alan Parivar were had to interact with the, uh, the modern world. Mm -hmm. And so some innovation was, was necessary. The, 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 the um, uh, purpose or the, the uh, concern was the same to involve people in bhakti. Um, through the angas of bhakti, the limbs of bhakti, the, the practices of sadhana bhakti, in a way that they could actually become absorbed. I mean, this is the whole center of it. It's not just some rote thing that you go through every day, but the idea is that by it you can control the mind. Therefore, a sadhaka has to be skillful, as I say sometimes. So you might find you can, your mind can become more absorbed by hearing than by chanting or by arching and by kirtan, um, with deference also always to kirtan, given that it's, it's the dharma for the yuga and so forth, and, and it's power. Um, but the point being is the idea that the, 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 to, to harness the mind and the senses. Um, and so, you know, like I say, if you're in Bengal or, or uh, living along the bank of the Ganges, and there's a method for controlling the mind uh, for uh, with uh, esoteric yantras of the leela to memorize and, uh, and, and so forth. I mean, this is really, what this is really about um, is a an approach to smarm, an approach to, to master, to controlling the mind, so to speak. And, and, and once you, once that's done, it's like, um, let's take Buddhism, for example, okay? <laughs> Go in a different direction. Buddhism, um, the Buddha just said, look, the world is about suffering, you're suffering, I've got the cure. Hmm? And the cure is that the, 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 the cause of the suffering is the thirst for things, desire. And so you have to extinguish desire. Desire. Nirvana means to blow out. I don't mean to blow everybody out, but I mean like to blow out a candle. <laughs> I think he blew some minds, but uh, sitting under the tree, as he did, I was saying the other night, all he did was sit under a tree. The whole world came to him. Hmm? Ashok came to him in India, and India came to him then, because the king now, who had the sword, was a Buddhist, so you had to be a Buddhist too. Um, but it was powerful. He just sat, right? It's easy to sit, hmm, but not that easy to sit for too long. <laughs> uh, if you sit for long enough, the whole world will come to you. The TV cameras will come, the newspapers will come. They'll watch you 24 hours to see if you're actually moving, <laughs> sleeping part of the time, and so forth. The whole world will come to you, offer itself to you. Mm -hmm. So, it's powerful. But in his um, teaching, he kept it simple. Oh, it's a complicated, <laughs> in one sense, to reason about its ideal. But basically, he says, 
world's about suffering and it stops suffering and there are ways that we can conduct ourselves in the world that will um, extinguish the desires. And so any philosophical or theological questions beyond that, he didn't entertain them. So from the Hindu perspective, or the Vaishnava perspective, the Gaudi Vaishnava perspective on, on the Buddha, um, this was a very pragmatic approach. Uh, disassemble, deconstruct the ego. Hmm? Which is, I often say, is we are our desires. Hmm? The advertising companies are savvy, you know, to that, right? So they, they, and they pick up on your internet where you where you've searched, so they know your desire. That's you. That's your car. That's you. Mm -hmm. uh, that, or this is your whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, we're kind of made up of our desires. It's a false um, identity. Our desire for 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 wiring. For having, and then there's a there's a there's a having does away with knowing. Mm. So the uh, the self that arises out of um, having is very very empty, very vacuous, very um, uninformed, and not sustainable. So anyway. So he didn't answer questions beyond it. And, and the reasoning there, from our point of view, is that yes, if you can deconstruct the ego hmm, and harness the mind, this opens a world of unlimited possibilities. I mean, the mind has unlimited possibilities in comparison to the dream state, in comparison to the waking state. I'll give a simple example. Probably just say, well, you can, you can, you can have a mountain and you can have gold, but you can't have a gold in a mountain, but you can in your mind. Mm -hmm. So the possibilities are increased. Um, the mind, the, the dream state. This is this is the realm of meaning and possibilities and uh, values and uh, and so forth. The physical world has, has none of those things in and of itself. So. At any rate, beyond the mind is the self. Hmm? And when it's uh, unencumbered by the mind, by psychic and then physical matter, then it's what its possibilities are, are I mean, you can't imagine. Hmm? And so he kind of wanted to open the door to that and then why talk about it? Just get to this point and then um, those possibilities they, they don't even can't even adequately be described with words and thought and philosophy. You'll be at, at the doorstep. Um, I have a nice book on the nature of consciousness by a Buddhist author who's uh, uh, educated in uh, Oxford, I believe, and it was his, I think it was his PhD thesis, a very, very good book. And uh, he had this particular perspective um, on Buddhism, although he wasn't promoting Buddhism in his book, he's a Buddhist, and he, he was promoting the idea that consciousness is the I am of each individual that will never go away. It's not a product of the brain, um, and so on and so forth, which is naturalism, philosophicalism, materialism, uh, these common, uh, these prominent disciplines today. And so, he made some really good arguments because he was well educated, right? With the opposing perspective, the naturalist, materialistic perspective. But um, when he gets to the end, um, uh, of the book, then he asserts that that each unit, that each uh, each I am is individual. Hmm? Not something you characteristically hear from a, from, from a Buddhist, but he, obviously he is a Buddhist, so he felt that Buddhism could accommodate this 
Hmm? If you look at the, the poly canon through a particular lens that made sense. Hmm? Um, and so he posited that there are individual atmas, really, without using that word, and that they become, what comes before them is unlimited possibilities, which, without saying so, he was obviously referring to different spiritual disciplines that are ego-effacing, that once the ego is effaced by a particular method, have a corresponding result that may be varied, making for a varied transcendence, hmm? right? Like a god, if you will, it's like a jewel that can be turned different ways and you see the different, uh, what do they call it, uh, facets, facets of the, of the jewel. Hmm? So it's very um, kind of Gaudiya-ish, if you, if you will. Um, but uh, the point is, anyway, that I'm making is that, um, that the central focus, in one sense, of the bhakti discipline is to control the mind. I mean, bhava bhakti is a controlled mind. It's controlled because the sarup shakti has taken over the mind and taken over the senses or started to in a significant way. Hmm? Um, so, we want to control the mind, we want to control the mind by inviting this group Shakti to bless us. So, as I often say, we, our effort is to get grace, right? Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of effort that you may find than what you find in Gyan or Yoga, which is more self-asserting. Our effort is self-abnegating. Mm -hmm. Pujapad Chita Marsh used to say that uh, you know, we're going forward negatively, but das, das, anu das, we're simply going backwards, but that's propelling us uh, forward into a realm that is all about love, the ground in which is seva, because if you love someone, you want to do something for them, right? It's very simple. So, our goal as in sadhana bhakti, which is largely external, which is practicing the angas of bhakti with the senses, hmm, is aimed at harnessing the mind through the such such sadhana bhakti hmm, that then invites, predisposes, encourages. Uh, enlivens the sarup shakti to bless us. Hmm? It's descending, right? Hmm? So, for example, if we want to become a gopa or a gopi, it's a good idea, right? That's our idea. So, but then, you know, as I often say, you, you, you have to have some, if you want to go to India, you have to have a ticket, you have to have a passport, you have to have a visa, you have to have all these things. So, something to be done. Hmm? That's what we call sadhana bhakti. And when the sadhana bhakti be, becomes steady, hmm, consistent, uninterrupted, then taste comes. Hmm. So as we ascend to the different stages, we're, you know, we're taken, we're going to be taken to the next stage by way of um, um, identifying ourselves, absorbing ourselves that much more with with bhakti. Hmm? So, so con anyway, controlling the mind. Baba bhakti means I mean, this is a controlled mind with the intellect. In Rajita, some intellect is active as well. Hmm? I mean, there's a spiritual, a spiritualized intellect in each instance. Hmm? In in, in Nishta, Ruchi, in Asakti, then. Intellect is not as prominent, and then Bhava Bhakti and your, your, your practices, the same practices now are all driven by emotion. The mind is, a Shrub Shakti is riding on the mind, and so forth. So, my point only is there may be different ways in which we, we in the context of Bhakti, 
try to harness the mind, that's the yoga of it. Hmm? So you could live in Navadweep, for example, or a garage or somewhere and have a map and, you know, this kind of uh, uh, approach, kind of a systematic approach to sadhana. Um, then again, only to the extent to which you're actually capable of doing that in a meaningful way, hmm? which requires a, a pure heart, and um, so I don't want to take the mystery out of that, but I mean, I am to some extent. I'm saying that is all about harnessing the mind through bhakti, controlling the, uh, this, 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 this uh, deconstructing the, the hunkar mm -hmm. and ornamenting the, the, the I am of us. I am in the context of the influence of the Sarup Shakti. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what Bhakti Vinod Thakur in the hands really is his, his, um, idea, if you will, of interfacing with the modern world in the hands of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthi Thakur, he took it. He made some innovation, so he was, his emphasis was on kirtan. He, he tried to engage his, his, his students in teaching what Gaudi Rajnam was about. There's a huge emphasis on sadhana, on, excuse me, on, on siksha, right? On siksha, 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 because many people were nominally Gaudi Rajnamas and they didn't really understand it. Hmm? They were in name only and they weren't getting anywhere. And there were also gurus who didn't understand it. And they used it as a business, and there were misrepresentations. Mis it's not only in the modern time. <laughs> there was, there were, you know, there's no, people sometimes say, I want a guru from India. Well, per capita, you've got more bogus gurus in India than you've got in any other country. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, that shouldn't discourage us, that there are bogus gurus there can only be bogus gurus if there are real gurus, right? So, so keep looking. So, so they innovated, and their, and their emphasis was on on Siksha Bhakti. You know, they written so many books. There was no one like Bhakti Vinod. Um, for centuries, who was so prolific in his writing, and in his writing, he's trying to reach out to the rest of the world and so forth, which is going at a pretty, pretty good clip, pretty fast, moving in a very far away from the kind of structure and support of that a little village along the bank of the Ganges that's like not almost like not in the world still is able to give to a culture. Uh, that, uh, that was um, initiated, so let's say, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago. Well, the, the rest of the world is not going to be going there too quick and doing that. Um, and people from other parts of the world where that culture isn't there, they may need some other ways to approach the high ideal in terms of the interim of controlling the mind, controlling the senses, and so forth. So, so his emphasis on kind of outreach or, or preaching and trying to explain the teachings, you know, to others, the good tidings of Gord and Tananda, it has a lot of capacity to con control your mind. It might be easier for you to do than to go sit under the banyan tree, you know, and not, and like Ari Das Thakur, right? If you can do that, that's one thing. If you, if you can't, uh, you know, let's find another way to you can go in the back door. If you can't go in the front door, to try to harness the mind. I'm not sure how I got up this tangent or uh, with regard to your question about gurus, but they do have to have controlled minds. <laughs> um, but um, um, uh, maybe it'll come back to me, but, but at any rate, uh, um, this um, um, 
system, uh, there may be different, different approaches to the same, um, let's say, interim goal that will then open up the inner the world of possibilities. And if you've gone there through kirtan um, and, and, and appropriate practices um, as taught in our parivar to the highest ideal, as that false ego is deconstructed, you're simultaneously constructing a spiritual ego. And Bhava Bhakti, you, you really don't, we, we can teach about it, you know, how to combine that you need a Vibhav, you need a, a, a you need a Udipanas, you need uh, this kind of Vibhav, that kind of Lamana Vibhav, Udipana Vibhav, you need Sattvika Bhav, you can talk about it, but in Bhava Bhakti, combining these ecstatic ingredients is is possible and somewhat natural, hmm? as much as they, in one sense, arise out of the, the sprout of the bhav that is one's one's diet. So you're in the midst of it all. You're in you're in bhav. So to try to um, do bhava bhakti and sadhana bhakti is what I'm saying is a little difficult. <laughs> And so do sadhana bhakti, understand the focus and the world of spiritual possibilities will become um, um, open to you and that in relation to your approach. Our approach is bhakti, tarag bhakti, uh, um, and, and, and so forth. So, um, so gurus. Uh, <laughs> Forgive me, but uh, somehow I, I uh, uh, went in a, a direction for the, the moment. Um, uh, but um, what I think what I was um, pointing out is that not only do you um, need to qualify the gurus, but you need gurus that can, um, are qualified in relation to the world that you're living in, whether it be London or Brighton or um, Helsinki or um, Warsaw, uh, and, you know, the, the whole, the internet, you know. <laughs> You live on the internet. This, this younger generation is doing more and more. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, such gurus have to be not only acquainted uh, with the tradition, hmm, but with the world, and and try to create an environment. Uh, that will be able to facilitate practice. This is a real challenge. It's a huge challenge. It's very difficult. So, um, you know, other than unqualified leaders, which is which is a problem, um, um, uh, the world is a problem. It's it's very different. It's it's, uh, it's not a conducive setting for. Uh, you, you know, we went the other day to the, to the Jewish ghetto, and uh, here, and um, where we were in Krakow, and um, where the Jewish people were confined at a certain point by the Nazis, and they had synagogues and so forth. And we went inside and we saw artifacts from the Jewish religious tradition, which I was never very had never been very acquainted with. And it was very inspiring to see how they lived, but the way in which they lived in terms of their social norms and cultural sensibilities could turn a modern person off and think, well, they were weird. But what's missing in the equation is they were living in the entire old world, be it the Orient or Europe, or even in, in, in the Americas, amongst the Native Americans, the entire old world was living in this world only for the purpose of going to the next world. 
how prominent was the idea that there is a there, there there is an afterlife to be attained is it's unbelievable how prominent that were you, you just look at the steeples i mean the whole architecture was for that music was for that art was was uh, uh, to be uh, as perfect as it inspired one to move, to conduct oneself in this world in such a way as to foster entering into that, um, that prospect, that possibility. That whole idea has just been, like, the head has been taken off. They're, they're, the head's still there, but like, there's somebody home, but the lights are out. In other words, uh, they think a lot of people, yeah, there's an afterlife, but it's just an afterthought. Hmm? It's not like I'm thinking, it's not on my mind now. Hmm? And, it, and you can see how they were living. It was on their mind from the moment they woke up till taking rest and they dreamt about it. Whether it be a Jewish tradition, or we went to the Dominican uh, monastery there, or whether it be and there's so many corollaries also corresponding between Hinduism hmm, and um, that doesn't mean to say we should all go put on hamakos or whatever or, you know whatever the tradition is it could be it could be, it could be Jewish or it could be um, Christian or Hindu uh, no we're living in a different world but we need to bring the the afterlife in, in the, into something to be more than an afterthought so to speak and then you know. And, and deal with the, the world we're living in, in such a way that we can um, create a conducive situation for um, making progress. And it's, it's a real um, challenge uh, to do that. Uh, I think that I began speaking about Bhakti Vinod a little bit by way of saying that in the time of Bhakti we know there was a lot of nominal Gaudiya Vaishnavism going on, and so he emphasized on, on Siksha, right? And then he wrote so many books in Bhakti Siddhanta emphasized on Siksha, 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 Siksha. And so here, to so get back to the, your question, here is an issue of Guru Tattva that has been so much misunderstood. What is a Siksha Guru? What is the difference between a Diksha Guru and a Siksha Guru? I mean, it, Prabhupada's disciples read Siksha Guru you know, a couple of times in the books, in his books, it's there in Chaitanya Charitamrita in the opening chapter. Um, but what the implications of all that might have been didn't come to bear in their lives because there was one figure, Prabhupada, who embodied the Diksha and Siksha, um, and he was putting out 400 page books every month of Siksha. He doesn't even think about it, um, but after he uh, kicked us out of the nest, so to speak, and flew back, you know, uh, well, not back, but anyway, <laughs> back to Godhead, <laughs> uh, then, uh, uh, you know, these. Um, this is an aspect of the Guru Tattva, a multiplicity of gurus, uh, you know, plurality of gurus, uh, different ways in which uh, this um, Siksha Guru term could be applied hmm? in a general way, in a specific way, in a way that even um, took more prominence in your life than the Diksha Guru. There are different ways in which that it depends on the person. One might have in a general way say, oh, uh, like the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who had disciples, hmm? and they knew one another, Bon Maharaj, knew Sridhar Maharaj, knew Keshav Maharaj, knew uh, Puri Maharaj, and so forth. And, and so they had some, they were different, they had their own missions, but they had some kind of camaraderie. They kind of had like what, what would have been nice if it happened in ISKCON, uh, 11 gurus 
in 11 different, in 11 different sections of the world where they paid attention and were the leading inspiration and they all had their own particular flavor of Prabhupada, so to speak. And you could go there and taste that flavor of Prabhupada through them, or, you know, or another one in another place, um, and so forth. So uh, that would, I thought that would have been very nice. Loving gurus for a mission like this, it's a fair number, it's a pretty good number. You know, now they want 1,100, you know. That, that means it's getting to be a problem here. <laughs> Because they're not very, these are not like common commodities. Hmm? Again, if you understand Guru Chakwa, you can understand Sudula uh, Bhagavata, you know, okay, I mean, this is a rare commodity. And that means it's a rare commodity on every level. Jiva hmm? Goswami gives three levels of Mahabhagavatas, each level is rare. Hmm? Pujapachita Marsh gave an example. One has two feet in the spiritual world and extends one here. One has one foot here and extends one there. The other has two feet here and his eyes or her eyes are always there. Hmm? So these, this was a way of speaking about the um, three types of Mahabhagavatas uh, elaborated upon by Jiva Goswami. He gives the example of Nara Muni who saw Krishna in the forest, and then Krishna disappeared. Hmm. He's the first kind of Mahabhagavata. He's obviously not perfected his life, spiritual life. Krishna appeared to, yes, I'm here. I'll come after him, intensify his practice, and so forth. Hmm. He had desire seeds, but his Bhakti was so powerful. It's like if you take water and you pour it on a seed and you keep pouring it, it's never going to sprout because it's going to get waterlogged. Hmm? So the seeds couldn't couldn't manifest. Hmm? Uh, this type of Mahabhagavata. And then the second example of Jiva Goswami is, and I was speaking about him last night. Who's that? Sukadev Goswami. He's a Mahabhagavata who's got one foot here and extending one there. He's not perfect. Sukadeva Goswami, the speaker of the Bhagavatam, he's a sadhana siddha, making progress through kirtan. This was his way. He has been described in, the, in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu as an example of one who became perfect by kirtan. Santa Goswami describes him as in, in pursuit of Gopi Bhav, hmm? speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. And he spoke the fifth canto and third canto. Hmm? This is his method. Hmm? He didn't just speak the tenth canto, but when he got there, that was the longest canto. Hmm? It's almost bigger than all the other cantos together. So he was, he, he arrived at the tenth canto and he was qualified to dive into uh, the, the, uh, the person of Krishna and, uh, and uh, his brother Leela and so forth. Uh, um, and, and then of course the third type is, is again Narada Muni. After he received his Swarup, in the first canto, he's given his Swarup, awarded a Swarup of a spiritual body. Hmm? Um, by, by Krishna, hmm? and then he's in the world. So he's got two feet there, and he's come here, something like that. So all of these Mahabhagavatas are rare gems to find, and you will not be able to distinguish between them without applying your intelligence in the teaching. Hmm? So part of the problem of Guru Tattva is that, is that the, the, the students are not applying themselves to the text. Of course, they have to be educated by somebody, but well enough to, to understand who's who and, and whatnot. Hmm? Um, so uh, important, the, the scripture is important, 
Vladimir Bhakti Vinod Thakur was writing so many books, the emphasis of Bhakti Siddhanta on Siksha, Siksha, Siksha. It's not that it's more important than Diksha. The seed is as important as the water. You know, if I give you a seed, I don't give you any water. But then what? If I give you water and I don't give you a seed, then what? So the seed, hmm, Diksha, the mantra, hmm, is the whole idea in the seed form, hmm, the whole concept in the seed form. It's how Jiva Goswami describes Diksha. Hmm? That it contains a relationship with Krishna in the mantra. Hmm? Jiva Goswami tells us in his Bhakti Sandarbha. We should think like this, he says. I received this guru, this mantra from my guru. Hmm? May I chant this mantra such that I may become a gopa. That's what he says. Or, I may become a gopi. That's basically what he says. Hmm? I mean, that's the fruit of the mantra. It's not like you got to do something else with you. You know, you know here's the Hare Krishna mantra. Could I have something more? Okay, here's the gopa mantra. Could I have something else? Yeah, maybe you want to use those two you know, together. Uh, and understand the significance of the diksha and so forth and apply yourself. But at any rate, they were giving siksha. So I just bring it up because the siksha guru, that's been a problem. You know, turning again to your question, what is this? The prophet's disciples didn't understand what is a siksha guru. Therefore, when I, for example, embraced a siksha guru in the person of Pujit Padbhakti Radhakshita Dinwasami Maharaj, I was thought to be, uh, you know, um, uh, diseased, somebody told me. I saw you in the marketplace, he told me. I used to see you sometimes, I thought, he's diseased. I saw, I, was, I, I, I met one, I, I was a fellow coming from Mandy, I can't remember his name, but I met him, and I, I thought, oh, he's so sorry, and I met him, I was talking, it was years ago, I was talking to him, and he was looking at me, and I think, what was on his mind? What was he thinking? It looked so weird, you know. Looking at me like I, like he'd just seen a ghost. I realized, you know, that here I am talking to this guy and he's rejected Prabhupada is basically what they thought. So, you know, obviously that was far from the case. I embraced someone who could show me a side of Prabhupada that only he knew. He had a relationship with Prabhupada. I mean, I knew everything that my godbrothers knew and god sisters knew about Prabhupada. Hmm? I mean, I don't know all the anecdotes they tell in all those books they write that are popular about Prabhupada, but I, I was pretty well read in Prabhupada's books. Hmm? I mean, I was very well read. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> I only did that. I read the books and I sold the books. That's all I did for years. We'd read them in the car, going out, read them in the car, going back, wake up, chant, read them, go out, sell them, take lunch, read them. So, I mean, that's what I did for years and years. Um, and so there was a 400 page book of Siksha coming out every month. And, and, Others may have went as well, but I was reading them and trying to digest them. Hmm? I was fortunate to be to, to get the uh, uh, um, when they printed the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Hmm? Um, they and and with Bhagavatam also they, they would do a few books that had gold, you know, bonding on them around the pages gold, and then that would be a set for Prabhupada and a couple of other persons. And I was just uh, uh, a, a brahmachari, but someone, I knew someone, see it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> if you know Krishna, you're okay. If you, if you know, so I knew somebody in the BBT, and he was in charge of it, more or less. So he was sending me, I didn't ask him, but he was sending me a copy off the press and I got these gold bound ones. I shared them with other buddies. So we were getting the Chaitanya Charitamrita like 
before it had actually been circulated to the rest of the devotees, and we were just devouring the book, and, uh, and so on. So, um, so I knew, I, I, I mean, as much as Prabhupada's in his books, right, in his, 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 his Bani, hmm? you might tell a lot of nice stories about Prabhupada, but if you don't understand his teaching, you might misunderstand the anecdote also. Uh, it's quite possible what the implications of it were and so forth. Like, for example, I, I know somebody who wrote a book with an anecdote about Prabhupada didn't want us to associate with Sridhar Maharaj. After going to the moth and inviting him, he said, no, I don't think we should. Hmm? Changed his mind as if, but he didn't understand, because he didn't understand the, really the teaching, hmm? he came to that conclusion. The real conclusion is, Prabhupada obviously wanted us to have the Sikh of Sridhar Maharaj, but certain circumstances got in the way. If those circumstances were removed, then there you go. And what were the circumstances? The circumstances were, Pujapat Sridhar was a popular sannyasi in, in, amongst his godbrothers who would go to him and ask questions, seek his association. They would pay their obeisances outside the moth before coming in. And they were gurus with their own missions. So, at the same time, some of Prabhupada's godbrothers were inimical to Prabhupada. And Siddhar Marsh was a very gentle kind of person, very much harmonizer. And it's hard. Let's say, let's say somebody really bothers you. Right? And, and, and inappropriately so. And I know that person too. Let's say we we're both, the three of us were friends. Now this guy's really, really does something terrible to you. You're gonna come and tell me and you want my sympathy. And I'm gonna go, yeah, you know, but you know, because it didn't happen to me and I've got my relationship with him also. It's, you know, I'm not going to like, you don't want to see the guy anymore. And I go, well, I'm not ready to, you know, not see him anymore. I mean, it's bad what he did, but I mean, I, you know, he comes over to my mom, you know. So, uh, this is a nice quality in one sense of, of, of Sri Maharaj. So, probably was concerned that my disciples may go associate with him. And then some other god brother who's inimical towards me, or doesn't appreciate, understand me, he may um, say something to them and, and harm their faith. And he had some experience of that. Therefore, because of those circumstances, maybe it's not the best idea, that, although I really would like that, to bring the whole world to hear from Sri Marsh. After all, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsvatthapa more or less told Prabhupada to do that. One of the things he asked Prabhupada to bring him out. Hmm? And this is the greatness of Prabhupada, that he tried to do that and in his own mission, he saw there was problems with it. And then after he was gone, of course, Sri Ramar said, he brought me out, <laughs> even after he left. He said, you know, send, he, he opened the door for you to come to me, which he did. He said we could hear from Sri Ramar and so forth. So, at any rate, you, you know these things, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's what we are here, <laughs> so to speak, um, um, that we understood that properly. But it was very much misunderstood. So this is an example. Hmm? They didn't understand what it, mean, what it means to be a Stiksha Guru. Now, some, in some institutions, one in particular I could think of in which a lot of my godmothers and god sisters are in, it's a factory for Patishta for them. That's what it is. It's a factory. Hmm? Wherever they go, they're honored and and they're six sugars, get the garland to get everybody. Into, he's a six sugar, and if he's not a six he's a six sugar. Everybody, because the original, unfortunately, 11 gurus were, have had difficulty walking in Prophet's shoes, you know, then they, rather than hearing from Shudamars, they watered the whole thing down and made. Many gurus, hmm? more gurus, more gurus, more gurus. 
you can have as many as we want because even if they fall down, we've got Prabhupada, you know, that kind of idea. You know, it's just like a yeah, very confused idea, right, about understanding of Guru Tattva. And um, um, so, uh, meanwhile, uh, they, they started to elevate everybody as a guru by this term Siksha Guru. Well, the Gabra is a, they're, they're Siksha Gurus. God says they're Siksha Gurus. We're the Diksha Guru. They're the Siksha Gurus. And, they, and so then all these new people are coming and they're just like the peons, you know. And, they, and I mean, the idea that the people that were coming could be teachers of them, you know, was not something that was, um, well, I'm really getting off here on the film about this, but uh, it ended their mind so well, which is how a guru really thinks, right? We get the example of Bhakti Siddhanta, who, who, who gave the famous address, more humble than a blade of grass, and when he said, sitting on a seat like this, that I consider all of my disciples have been sent to me by Bhakti Vinod to teach me, to keep me engaged, and so forth. Hmm? Um, so, uh, this, um, it's a rare, this is a rare thing, the Guru. I mean, we hope it's rare, uh, you know, to, to, that our ideal, let me say, is not cheap. We didn't want a cheap ideal. We, we were courageous enough to identify with an ideal that was, took some courage hmm? to was to go climbing to the highest peak, right? The Mount Everest of spiritual life. And in, 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 in the context, if we were listening properly, of being informed how unqualified we were, <laughs> but how qualified we were at the same time because of the nature of Krishna, the nature of his Swarup Shakti is generous and so, Unqualified I may be, but that makes me more qualified. Hmm? That's the teaching, right? The more you understand you're unqualified, the more qualified you actually become. Hmm? So, this misunderstanding of the Siksha Guru for many of my godless and god sisters was was very unfortunate because it it didn't enable them to take advantage of, of probably the most qualified Siksha Guru for Prabhupada's disciples. Which is Patrita Mushroom Prabhupada that had lived with for years, and Prabhupada wanted to start a mission around, uh, who Prabhupada wanted to bring to Mayapur, had not lived there, but the circumstances didn't permit. Now those circumstances are gone. Right? Prabhupada, when Sridhar Mahesh was, at some point Sridhar Mahesh said it was, I don't know why I'm still here. This one's gone, Swami Mars is gone, Bond Mars is gone, this one, I'm, I'm not, no, old, I'm blind, I haven't been able to move off my veranda for years. They're moving around and they're all gone, I'm still here. Hmm? So the, where's the problem now, you understand? The circumstances. So if we understood Prabhupada's instruction on the matter, we would run to Sridhar Mars and have good, good association and so forth. But many of them missed that, so it's just, um, I perhaps shouldn't have gone on to, into that at such, you know, uh, depth or um, with such candor, but uh, misunderstanding the concept of a Siksha Guru, mm, the plurality of Gurus, how um, it really has to do with the ornamentation of the Advaita and Tattva, even different sentiments. Um, that there could be different sentiments, like Sakyaras or uh, Dasaras, uh, gurus. That's misunderstood also by, by persons. Um, a couple of a couple of things come to mind. How rare it is, what a real guru is. What, what it's also it's, it's understanding what what a Guru teaches. Hmm? He or she teaches bhakti. And 
and makes an effort to uh, nourish our faith in the scriptural argument and ideal. Hmm? That's the guru's business. Hmm? But because we don't understand guru tattva, then uh, we have other expectations that we think the guru should fulfill. And when he or she doesn't, then we, we uh, lose interest. Hmm? Um, you know, we, we, we want to we have more intimate association with our Guru so that we can share our life with him, which is largely our emotional issues and problems and so forth, that, that he or she is there to help us rise above, not by ignoring them, but by giving us something else to be preoccupied with that, that is meant, meant to help us harness those emotions and rise above them. All the problems are just, well, humans. There may be problems with the gurus, that's another thing, they don't understand it, and we went on that. The other side is, uh, again, expectations. You're human, the teaching is you're human, therefore you're going to have problems. Your mind and your emotions are going to rule, and I want to reason with you spiritually with the teaching so that you don't let that happen. But you do let it happen, and then you don't even realize that, that the solution to the problem is what the Guru's teaching. Then you want to come after you and say, oh, you know, what happened? Why are you not here? Why you press your emotional buttons and so forth? I'm not here to press your emotional buttons so that you get motivated because that's just a losing prop proposition. Hmm? I'm here to teach you that there's life beyond your mental, emotional life, and it can be emotional hmm? on a spiritual level, but you have to become steady in your practice, which means you have to apply your intelligence to understand the teaching properly and how to apply yourself relative to where you're at and, and so forth and, and go forward. And there are going to be emotional issues that come up that distract you and, and so forth. And yeah, that's, we know that. That's part of the, you know, your humanness that you're trying to transcend. But hmm? they, 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 you let that get the best of you and then you reason about it you rationalize it, hmm? and then there's something wrong with the guru. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that happens. Something wrong with the guru. Something wrong with the guru, the mission, you know, the, the, the teaching. Hmm? You just rationalized your own irrationality. Hmm? That's all. Hmm? And taken out of the equation, the very thing that the guru is there for, to teach you, to give the, uh, that, uh, how to rise above in such circumstances. So anishta bhajana kriya is a difficult, uh, you know, time. It's, it's unsteady. But understanding the guru and what the guru is for, rather than having false expectations and so forth, that will help to make the devotees um, strong. Hmm? Um, so there's another way of thinking about it. Hmm? Um, uh, misunderstanding the guru talk. I mean. Western people may be more inclined to that, uh, you know, having other expectations than just teaching bhakti. Another misconception or expectation is that um, my guru is going to magically, you know, think for me in every instance. He's he he knows everything. He's, after all, he's God's representative. I mean, <laughs> he knows everything. It, and whatever he says in his sleep is the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we should tell that to the people. Mm -hmm. Gurudev said this in his sleep. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, in Bhakti Sanatha's mission, um, when they were editing his books, Or his, I guess he wrote some things as well. They were everything he was writing in English. If there were misspellings, some of the disciples thought, if Guru Maharaj, quote unquote, misspells a word, we should change the dictionary. 
That's a misconception about Varun Tattva, also. You understand? And then, you know, the Guru, Guru Dev takes a drink of water and... Oh. <laughs> Must be some deep Leela behind that. Because <laughs> he never makes any mistakes. He's not a conditioned soul. He's beyond the four defects. He is beyond the four defects. Why? Because, <laughs> because rather than proceeding in life in a defective way through the medium of the senses and an uncontrolled mind, he or she is moving in the world through the light in the eyes of the Shastra. Hmm? Because he's moving through the eyes of the Shastra, therefore he's not making the mistakes that, that, that are part of illusion life and so forth. Hmm? But I mean, the, so this is, um, um, the idea that a guru is going to speak through a cultural filter of his or her time and circumstance and so forth is 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 thought by some to be um, um, a, a heresy. Hmm? It's a heresy. But they haven't studied the writing of Bhaktivinoda who makes that very point. Hmm? And um, so this is this kind of this idea that um, Again, is Sukadeva not a good, by this measure, Sukadeva is not a good enough guru. He wasn't perfect uh, in all respects. He was a sadhana person pursuing the siddha of, of, of Gopi Bhav through the context of Kirtan. He might have made a mistake sometimes. Uh, so, uh, Vyas, he's a guru. He wrote the Bhagavatam. And he said, you know what he said? No. Yes. He said, I've written this book. There are mistakes in it. That's what he said about the Bhagavatam. I've written this book. There are mistakes in it. Please overlook them um, because they're not significant, but there may be a grammatical error here or a problem there or something like that. Tuss, what's the verse? Yattak bisago janataka viplabo Yasmin Pratishlokam Abhadavati Vi Namani Anantasya Shinvanti Gayanti Gunanti So he says, there may be some problems in the book, some errors. This is Vyas. Hmm? He's written right in the book. Hmm? He tells us how to think about that. And then we're going to look at our Guru and imagine that, that every move, every, everything he says about, uh, you ask him, you know, who do you think will win the World Cup? <laughs> Croatia. <laughs> France won. Well, <laughs> anybody from France here? No, so. <laughs> I don't have any French disciples. We're okay. So, uh, you know, you ask him a question about something relative, and he may give an opinion. Um, you know, that, but if he speaks from Shastra, then you should give the Siddhanta, and uh, you know, so it's, so these things are misunderstood. Hmm? And um, and then um, you make a, a, a central uh, hub of the theology around something that he said that was relative or that was hyperbole. Let me give another example. Prabhupada once said, yes. Someone said to him, Prabhupada, I think your books are like the law books. Yes, my books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. You know, he said it once to somebody, somewhere, we believe somebody who said it. It's not reported anywhere. It's not written anywhere. But I believe that he said it. But it's not something to make the center of, your, of the whole philosophy. Because thousands of times Prabhupada said, preaching, siksha, giving teaching, sh is, should be done in such a way that it conforms with the time and the circumstance. 
Now, you tell me. Well, we weren't there, but how, how different, some of you, how different is it now from 19, so the prophet departed in 77, 1977? Hmm? It's 10,000 years difference. Because the world is going so much faster, so much more information. Hmm? And so you need new books. I mean, he said he wanted books. He wanted one of his disciples to write books and so forth. So, I mean, don't you think these instructions are more central than, yes, my books will be the law for the next 10,000? That's just kind of some kind of hyperbole. That's, you know, probably was like that, hmm? for good reason, hmm? right? So, uh, this is, as I said, sadhana is a skill, so to understand these things and, and understand the guru, it's not an easy thing to do, but and he's very that that principle, that person of the guru has been very much misunderstood. I've given a few uh, examples. It's misunderstood by those who have tried to be gurus. It's misunderstood by by those who are looking for gurus, those who have gurus. Um, um, we may, uh, with, without a clear understanding, we may offend our guru. Um, Jump to another guru and then another guru, and then um, and actually the principle of the Siksha Guru was in, in in time of the Goswamis, the founding of the Sampradaya was kind of a, a valve, you know, in 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 in, 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 in case the Diksha Guru for some reason had lack knowledge, uh, and one could have a Siksha Guru and then fulfill fill that that gap and so forth. Um, anyway, so this is some, some thoughts on the, on the subject. Um, but it is, yes, it is very much uh, uh, misunderstood. We have many uh, uh, false expect expectations that, that, that just, if those are not dealt with, it's just a recipe for, of, of not being able to take advantage of the solution to your problem, which is the person of Krishna appearing in the, in, in the form of the Guru in our lives. Hmm? Does that help? Yes, I'm going into some un forbidden areas there. Forgive me, but yes. I, uh, so, as a follow up question, I'm wondering you said about Shukadeva Goswami, uh, you said about Shukadeva Goswami. He perfected himself for Kirtan, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so he might have made some mistakes along the way and like that. And so similarly, even, um, like, I guess most devotees who do some kind of preaching and like that, they're also trying to perfect themselves through Kirtan. Or I guess what I'm asking is, uh, obviously there might be some, sometimes there might be mistakes made, that maybe not be such a big deal, but there might be some mistakes that can like, like you given the example that 10,000 books, you know, they can, they can warp things quite out of control. So what, is there a kind of qualification to be speaking on those topics? So, uh, yeah, well, the, the basic qualification for speaking is to speak according to your realization mm -hmm. and not beyond your realization. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, women will be better at this. Men tend to pretend they know more than they know. Women are much more reticent to, 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 to speak and put themselves forward unless they're sure, or they're, you know, more sure of themselves. Of course, they've been made to think like that by men <laughs> uh, to a large extent. Um, but um, um, so we should try to avoid speaking beyond our. You could say, I don't know, is sometimes the best answer. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, or you may say that is an area in which, you know, I'm not uh, proficient, so I can't speak in that area. But that's the basic idea, adhikar. Mm -hmm. yeah. But everybody has some realization, so they can share it. But again, I mean, Sukadev protect, protected himself by kirtan, and we have an emphasis in kirtan in, in our party where that's a fact. But it's not that other practices and so forth are, are not there. And, uh, uh, and important and, uh, and 
and uh, and but we, we 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 just I was talking about it in terms of kirtana prabhavi, smarana prabhavi. The kirtan is a very powerful way by which the mind can be harnessed, and then smarana swabhav we will naturally manifest. Hmm? Um, so you, to do smarana, which is central to raga and bhakti, really, there's no argument about it. Kirtan is, is, is the best way to qualify oneself for smarana. Hmm? But you have to understand what those qualifications are, that you may be able to take advantage of that anga of bhakti. Hmm? And it, and so, yes. So, Guru Maharaj, what is the biggest challenge for you to being Guru in the modern world? What is the Well, I don't know if there's a single uh, challenge. Uh, I think it's, it's challenging to provide as much as I would like to, a conducive environment for my students to progress in, um, given that the fact that they're spread out all over the world, in different places and so forth. Um, and um, also, in that regard, um, It's hard to form communities, even if they uh, people are in um, proximity uh, to one another. So we live in a culture that's very individualistic. A democracy, everybody's got their rights and their opinions should be heard and so forth. So I think we have deep some scars for for this uh, democracy. Mm. <laughs> You might be careful about your advocacy of free speech. Uh, I mean, we appreciate it. We can speak about Krishna and his advantages, but um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, even if devotees fantasize about being in an ideal community, um, I, I find that, the, that uh, people so much want their individuality don't want their lives organized, which has to be done in some sense in the community, that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, even if they live in proximity, to suggest, let's have a community here, and you can all just move 10 feet over here, and oh, I'm like over here. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, uh, it's difficult, um, um, given the world, to provide the kind of environment, that Prabhupada was successful in providing an environment uh, for practice for most of his students. But one of the, not to take anything away from Prabhupada, obviously, but one of the reasons was because we were joining ashram. We were already halfway in the ashram. We already left home. We were living on the streets, most of us. Mm -hmm. And we were living in a counterculture, which was revolutionary. And if you left, dropped out, so to speak, what was the saying? Tune in turn on and drop out, tune in and turn on, something like that. Tune in, turn on, and drop out. So if you had dropped out and you tuned in and turned on to the alternative culture, which was basically the sense that, that there's got to be a better way to do it. What it is, we have no idea. There's got to be a better way to do it. Let's smoke a little bit and think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, you know. So if you went from there, join an ashram, that was like, whoa, he really did it. He really went there. Whoa. That was like radical among the radical. Hmm? But as far as today's worlds go, goes, we were already like, you know, halfway there, right? So to join an ashram, as a young person who dropped out of college looking for a spiritual alternative to the uh, just very bland, materialism of the post-war America, for me anyway, in mean America. Um, it was uh, easy, easy to do. Um, 
and, uh, and we all had a lot in common, you know. Um, as different as we were, there were a certain common, commonality amongst us as being part of an alternative uh, counterculture. So, so anyway, probably was had temples that were thriving, people were joining, and they were, it, was, it was conducive for their practice. Things changed in the world, and um, it's harder to do that now. So um, uh, it's a challenge to try to provide it. And, and actually, I've come to the conclusion that 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 um, that's maybe that's going above and beyond the call of duty, <laughs> uh, because there. Uh, what can you do? So give the teaching, set a good example and let people contact the teaching that they will, and let them do what they want with it. And let them go with it where it, will, where it takes them and practice it. I mean, that's kind of where I, how I think about it now. Um, but it's, a, it's been a challenge to try to provide an environment that would be uh, uh, supportive like, you know, proper one of communities, for example. I mean, I, that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, and to do it on the internet and whatnot, it's a, that's a challenge. Um, I would say, also, uh, one of the largest challenges is the misconceptions about Guru that you, that you, that you inter encounter. Yeah, the idiocy, sometimes. Uh, the illiteracy, and so forth. Um, it's a real challenge. I mean, um, you know, I, I think that to sh I want to share whatever I have, mm -hmm. but there are impediments to sharing it mm -hmm. that are outside of me, beyond my control, that really constitute misunderstandings about the whole principle of Guru. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, these are some of the, you know, one of the greatest challenges is other devotees <laughs> and their, their lack of understanding. This is a real challenge. Their lack of understanding of the tradition, of the teaching, and of what the world is about, even. They're in, you know, so many of them, in, you know, just, I don't know, living in a conspiracy theory or something, you know. I mean, um, it's, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. So, you see, you know, you get inspired insight, you want to share it, and you go out like a young boy who just discovered something and wanted to tell everybody about it. I just saw this, look. And then you get this response that's it's just like, uh, I better go crawl back in my hole <laughs> and keep it to myself. <laughs> and then you find something else out and then you can do it again, you know. I keep doing it again. One of my biggest mistakes is that I, I repeatedly think that irrational people will listen to reasonable, listen to reason. I keep finding out it's not true, that's not true, that's not true. <laughs> but I keep doing it, that's frustrating. Um, and I would say it's also a challenge uh, for me to serve in this capacity. Um, um, having a lack of good uh, peer, peer uh, association. Hmm? I, I, I want to share things with others that have the ability to understand them and think about them and in, 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 in the same measure that I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there may be people like that, but you know, for different reasons, uh, and they're not, um, I don't have that kind of camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, so, some of the things that I don't know if anyone in particular is, is uh, a challenge. Um, so, thank you for your question. Anyway.
Yes? Um, in the story, when... In the story when Lord Shiva was married to Sati, and she wanted to go to the... I can't remember what it was, but it was a yagya with her father, Dick Daksha. And I'm wondering why Daksha didn't like Shiva. Okay. The reason that Daksha didn't like Shiva is because it's quite common for a father to think that no man is suitable for his daughter. <laughs> uh, that's, you have to talk to your parents about that one. <laughs> but um, Daksha, well, another broader answer is Daksha was interested in, in making money and having things and having material comforts and so forth. Daksha had a lot of material desires. He wanted a lot of things. Hmm? And so he used to perform yagyas to get those things. Hmm? He was like interested in karma. He was in the realm of karma. He wanted things. Hmm? And so he wanted things for his daughter too. Hmm? But she fell in love with this guy that lived in the, in, the, in the mountains. And he didn't even have clothes. <laughs> Shiva dressed himself in ashes. So Daksha thought, what kind of guy is this? You know? But what Shiva was about, see Shiva was a meditator. So Shiva didn't want things. He wanted, he wanted to know the soul, the Atma, the soul. He wanted to serve God in the spiritual world. So he didn't want the material world. Hmm? And so Shiva was so, Daksha was so interested in the material world that he didn't understand Shiva. He didn't understand what Shiva was about. And therefore he thought, this is not a good husband for my daughter. Hmm? And therefore, I'm not going to, I don't, I, I can't even look at the guy. Hmm? That's how he thought. So Daksha misunderstood Shiva. And he misunderstood, sometimes, just like, let me give you an example. Sometimes people, sometimes I walk on the street, I'm dressed like this, and people who are not spiritual, but they're material, hmm? They might even be in a different religion, but they're kind of material. They want God just to give them things. They ask, instead of asking God, how can I serve you? They ask God, please serve me. God give me this, God give me that, so forth. So they see me on the street and they go, what is that? They look, they don't know that somebody dresses like this, what they're about, why they dress like this. Like, I dress like this, I have the same clothes. You might notice I wear the same clothes every day. <laughs> I wash them. <laughs> I wear the same clothes every day. So it means I'm not um, always thinking about how I look. How do I look? How do I look? Maybe I'll wear this, maybe. maybe. You know, that, I'm not thinking like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not cons really concerned about that because I see something that's much more beautiful than however my body could be decorated. I see my atma, soul. I think that's oh, so beautiful. Hmm? I don't need to make the body all very pretty huh? but because the soul is much more pretty, so I look at the soul. And when I do that, actually the body becomes pretty too. Hmm? if you know a little something. Hmm? But if you're too much just uh, concerned about material things and just your material body, you don't understand that you're not the body, then you will misunderstand people like me and people like Shiva. My name is Swami Triparari, that's a name for Shiva. Triparari is a name for Shiva. 
So tomorrow we'll, we'll have a talk about Shivas. We'll give a talk about Shiva Tattva. Which I was, I was going to do anyway because some of the devotees had talked to me about that. So I'm just remembering that. So tomorrow or the next day, but probably tomorrow. Okay? Now, now, you can ask further questions about this of your parents. They'll try to further explain. Madhav Shiva Ki Jai. Aksha Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam Gita. Srimad Bhagavatam Gita.